Six thirty. We're gonna call the meeting to order. Okay. Can we have a roll call? Clemens. Clifford. Yes. Eisenman. Yes. Esri. Here. Portado. Goss. Here. Harper. Here. Ingram. Here. King Taylor. Here. McGuire. Patterson. Here. Rector. Uh, Rosales. Store. Summers. Here. Taylor. Here. Thorsland. Here. Tinsley. Present. Bashaspati. Here. Woken. Young. Here. Coward. Was a correction. <coughs> Under um, the county executive appointment, under policy personnel and appointment, the term was wrote down wrong, and we need to correct that. The term is from for the zoning board of appeal. Here, the term is from January the first, two thousand nineteen, to January thirtieth, forty. November. November. It's 11-30-2022. Okay. Okay, 11-30-22. 20, yep. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, we need approval of the minutes for the Committee of the Whole for November 13, 2018. Any discussion or correction? So what? Okay. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and second. It's open for discussion. Seeing that all in favor say aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, public participation. Seeing none, because no names came for. No, we're closed public participation. Any communication from the uh, board? Is she on? Yeah. Yeah, so the Martin Luther King um, celebration will be taking place this weekend, um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and Monday as well. And my wife, she's been nominated for one of the um, prestigious community awards. Her name is Alyssa Young, and she will be acknowledged um, Friday at the Vineyard Church at 4 o'clock. So if you guys can come out, I would really appreciate it. It's my lovely wife. She's on HRC, too. She's the chair. <laughs> And I have some additional flyers if you guys need any. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Rick. Uh, yes, uh, again on February 2nd, one winter night, we'll be in downtown Champaign to support the homeless. And uh, I think this will be my eighth year doing this. So uh, come down and say hi, bring me some money, and a uh, cup of coffee. But uh, it's really a great event for our town. So just wanted to announce that. Thank you. Oops, forgot one last thing. Can I say something? Yes, Mr. Young. So um, also, I just want to let everybody know that the new um, legislation laws that was passed back in December from Illinois State House is now out on the website. You can Google the new um, Illinois state laws, um, and it's in a PDF form. So just Google if you're concerned about state laws and you had a right to interpret and just know it's good to know that so they are out as of january 1st 2019. thank you 
uh, just as I'm now coming back into very cold, snowy weather, um, just a reminder that uh, several places are looking for uh, donations of winter clothing. Um, that includes the Cunningham Township office. We'll uh, accept that and get it into the right hands. Uh, also, Austin's Place, uh, which is the overnight emergency women's shelter, uh, is looking for anything like that that uh, can be provided. So if you're digging deep and doing any of this, especially right now while everybody's doing Now, now that everybody is uh, watching the Netflix specials and cleaning their entire house and dumping everything out of their lives, uh, if, if any of that happens to be winter clothing, please uh, look for one of these local organizations. If you have any questions about Austin's Place, uh, I'd be happy to answer them, um, and I'd be happy to take stuff from you and take it there. So thanks very much. Any more communication? Say seeing none, we're going to go into our committee, um, uh, our our committee meetings, and the first thing is justice and social service, Mr. Um, Cal Patterson. Thanks. Um, for first item, we have a uh, drug court presentation. For those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Jeff Ford, Circuit Court Judge, and I'm going to try and get this PowerPoint up here. Um, thank you for allowing me to come. Next to me is uh, Drug Court Coordinator, Amber Edmonds, uh, who's been with us for a number of years and is instrumental in everything we do. Amber's going to help. I want to, a lot of people don't know about drug court or think they know things about drug court and really don't. So I want to give you some information on what we have in drug court, just a little bit about what drug courts are, what we do in Champaign County, and then I want to give you some numbers. Their drug courts are type of problem-solving courts. Uh, mental health courts, veterans courts are the same thing. Uh, Supreme Court enacted standards for uh, problem-solving courts throughout the state of Illinois, and everybody has to be certified. And there's approximately 68 drug courts in the state of Illinois. I want to go first at the our results, so you understand what we're talking about here. We have uh, Graduations every six months. Uh, it was June in December. Now it's May and November, so that's why it's a little off. But the, the, the statistics for the last eight graduations, the last one was in November. We had 80 people graduate. Those eight, youngest was 21, oldest was 66, 26 female, 54 male, 43 Caucasian, 35 African Americans, one Hispanic, one Asian. For the 80 of them, they spent 131 years total in drug court. Averages to about 19 and a half months per person. Uh, one started using alcohol and cannabis when they were six years old. One started alcohol or cannabis at seven. Another one at eight. Our average age of, age of first use for alcohol or cannabis is 14 years. All started using in their teens and then moving on to cocaine, opiates, or other drugs. Not all of them, some of them just stay with alcohol or cannabis. Coming into drug court, these 80 people had 23 juvenile adjudications, 472 traffic tickets, 295 misdemeanors, and 296 felonies. Now when I say that, that's what they were convicted of. That's not how many were charged. You gotta kinda double that, because a lot of times cases are dismissed when they plead guilty. So. This is what they were convicted of, of those 80 coming in. Sentences included uh, 437 community-based, such as probation or conditional discharge, straight time in jail, 
30 days, 60 days, 180 days, 364, 98 were sentenced to that, 119 sentences to the penitentiary among those 80. During the 131 years they were in drug court, they had 11 petty traffic tickets such as stop sign, no seat belt, and two misdemeanor traffic offenses uh, such as driving under suspension. So we went from the 119 penitentiary sentences, all these felonies, and turned the 80 of them for the 131 years. This is what they did. And that's while they were in drug court. To graduate, a year confirmed sobriety, continuous involvement in 12-step program, no pending criminal charges, successful completion of all recommended treatment. The drug court team has to recommend them for graduation. Can't have any arrest warrants. If they get charged with a misdemeanor while they're in drug court, and we saw that a couple of them had misdemeanors, they have to be in drug court for six months after that case is taken care of. We want to make sure that they're changing their behavior. Involvement in a life skills program, such as being in education, school, uh, high school, college, GED, uh, employed, and almost everybody gets employed if they can work. And you've probably seen them all over town. We have a number of graduates, and some are now managers at places. Uh, or volunteer work. If they can't get a job just yet, we want them getting up in the morning like they had a job, getting out, getting noticed, doing a good job so they can get a job. Uh, some of them don't have a resume. This is how you build up a resume. They have to apply to graduate. Uh, includes a two-page essay that they have to write, kind of letting us know that they're ready. Uh, and they have to present in front of the drug court team. And we have about 10-minute presentations. And I tell them, look, if you want to get a job, if you have to make a presentation to somebody, this is what life is about. Make it in front of a group of friendly faces and see what you can do and how you have to do this to start moving forward. So this is just another thing we try and get them to do uh, to get them ready. The team, these are the minimum people that the Supreme Court said have to be on the drug court team for you to have in drug court. If you don't have one of these, you cannot be certified as a drug court in the state of Illinois. Also, the Supreme Court standards say all of these people have to be at our staffing and in court. Staffings for us are 10 o'clock Wednesday mornings. Court starts at 1. So these are the people that are necessary at a minimum to have a team. Uh, prior to court, we staff every participant that's come to court that day. Discussions include compliance with their treatment and counseling, drug test results from the prior week. Uh, we try and test at least two, sometimes three times a week. Their employment, are they working, are they still working, what their hours are, uh, whether there's an incentive or sanction is appropriate, and if there's going to be any other further type of action. And we do have set incentives, we have sanctions, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, there's three different types of drug courts, ours is a post adjudicatory, which means they plead guilty. Uh, they are placed on drug court probation for felony probation. Uh, there's different types of courts, and they can vary in the length of time and their graduation requirements. There's no standard for that. So we started our drug court in March of 1999. At the end of February, we will have finished 20 years in Champaign County. We take high-risk, high-need participants. Many have co-occurring mental illness. High-risk and high-needs, we do separate assessments to make sure that they are basically, the Supreme Court says, medium to high-risk. So we take some upper-medium-level risk. Uh, there's assessments for that that our probation office and all probation offices use across the state as to monitoring. And then needs, basically needs, and, well, and risk isn't just prior criminal record. It's all sorts of risks that keep them in the criminal justice system. And the needs are such as mental illness, substance abuse problems, and other problems uh, that w need to be addressed. The research has shown this is the population you want. If you take low risk, high needs, if you take high risk, low needs, you're mixing population. And all the research has shown that those other categories do just as well on regular probation or other community-based sentences than in drug court. And of course, drug courts, we have extra expense. We have more professionals coming 
as you saw, you want to put your resources to where the needs are, where you're going to get a change. If you can get that change in regular probation, why are we putting them in there? And plus, you don't want to mix these groups because if you put a high risk, high need with a low risk, no, low need, what we may do is make that low risk, low need a better criminal. We don't want to do that. We've got to keep them separate. So we take that category, which means they're difficult groups to work with. So, um, it's a voluntary program. Nobody is forced in. Uh, they can't be a danger to the public coming in. If I can't have Amber or one of our clinicians sitting across the table talking to them because we're afraid for their safety, then that person's not getting in drug court. Um, they have to plead guilty to a felony, sentence to drug court probation, and of course, as I stated, our court is every Wednesday. We staff Wednesday morning, courts in the afternoon, like I stated. Rewards can include praise, gift cards, applause, calling them up earlier than we normally would, days off from court. Uh, they're provided for good work, completion of certain milestones in there. The research has shown rewards are very powerful. Uh, and the more you can do and the more you can have them meet certain milestones, the better your results are going to be. Sanctions, uh, and as I, I had somebody enter drug court today, and I tell them, you may think it's punishment, we don't. What I say is, we're trying to change your lifestyle and your behavior. Basically, we're giving you a line to walk on. If you step off that line, we're going to do what's necessary to put you back on that line. Sitting in my jury box and watching the rest of the afternoon is a sanction. That has been used very well. Writing an essay, two or three page essay, uh, kind of getting them to self-reflect. Public service work. Uh, we also, instead of just sanctions, there's treatment interventions, treatment adjustments such as more substance abuse group meetings or more uh, sobriety-based group meetings. But we can also use curfews and other things as sanctions and even jail. Uh, a night in jail for somebody might do them a whole lot more good, especially since our, our sanctions are progressive. And normally they just get a little harsher, although our sanctions go to what the behavior is. And so if they're, if they would be ready for jail at a certain time, but because of what they did, it's not worth putting them in jail. We can get that message across for another reason. That's what we do. And I tell them they're in charge. We will sanction you if you want to be sanctioned. You follow the rules. You're not going to be sanctioned. But that's how it's based. Uh, and if the person needs to be punished, then they're terminated from the, the program. We don't punish. We'll sanction, but it's not a punishment. Uh, we have had 298 people graduate since our first graduation in June of 2000. What I want to really get across to you is drug courts have been the most evaluated system in the criminal justice system ever. This is a 2011 multi-site adult evaluation. It's a meta-analysis of a lot of different types of uh, research that was done, and they chose certain ones. I went to the uh, cost one, cost-benefit cost analysis, which starts on page 228 of it. So there's a lot of information here. But I wanted to go through a few things so you understand what drug court has done for our community. Uh, they identified all the costs of drug court programs, every cost you could think of these researchers went through. Focused on the benefit estimation out, on outcomes alone, didn't count inputs that occur after the participation ends. Basically, what they did was cost-benefit analysis for the 18 months that people are in drug court, were in drug court. They didn't do any cost benefit for after they graduate. So this is just for the time that they are in drug court. And 18 months kind of correlates with what I've shown you because our average stay is a little over 19 months. So it works out real well for our drug court. Um, this is, I took some quotes out of there so you can understand what they were doing, but drug court participants on average committed only $7,111 worth of crime while their control group of people just like the people in drug court but were not sentenced to drug court uh, committed $16,887 worth of crime in that same 18-month period. So they estimated drug court results in $9,776 of victim crime costs prevented. Now, 
what does that mean for us? Well, it doesn't save Champaign County uh, government money, but it saves the people who elected us all money because it saves them money from their places being broken into, things stolen, identity theft, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, estimate that drug court costs reduced police arrest costs from $115 per individual to $44, $71 per participant savings. Reduced costs of jails and prisons from $54.41 to $27.68. Total savings in correction for the 18 months following program entry of $2,673 per participant. Aggregating across savings prevented crime, arrests, and incarceration, drug courts produced an average of $11,408 of benefits during that 18-month period per participant. Uh, in our sample, the average treatment usage among drug court participants, now this you would expect, it costs more to treat drug court participants than people who don't want to go to treatment and who are in the same situation. So there are costs that are more for drug courts, such as treatment, than uh, regular comparison groups. They found the average comparison individual cost society 14575 during the year and half estimated that the average drug court participant cost society only $12,362. Doing this all out, they said drug court appears to prevent about $11,566 in criminal victimization compared to not receiving drug court. And that, of course, is the 18-month period. Uh, reduction in use of corrections, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the type of analysis they went through. So Champaign County Drug Court. As of May 2018, which is the last time we updated any statistics, we had 746 people sentenced to drug court. We've had 290 graduates as of May 2018. If you just cost 11000 Look at $11,400 per graduate for the duration of their participation in drug court. The people we graduated, which were in there the least 18 months, over a similar group means that during that time uh, that we were in existence, we saved Champaign County, the residents of Champaign County, over $3 million just for the 290 graduates. There were 456 people who didn't graduate, though. Uh, not all of them remained in the program for 18 months. I've had people who left after a day, got them out of jail, put them in residential, walked in the front door, walked out the back door. I had one who walked in the front door, stayed for dinner, and then walked out the back door. But, you know, they lie to us all the time, but it's not that we're not trying. I've had others who've been there for almost two years who have not yet graduated or didn't graduate for one reason or another, but they were still in the program, which means in the program you saw the reduction in crime. So there's still those savings. So if you just assume that of those 456 that they average nine months in the program, so if you take half of the 11,400 for those 456 during the period they were in because the research was just participants, not participants who graduated, we saved about 2500000 for the citizens of Champaign County. And I've got some recidivism stuff to hand out later for you, but we monitor one year, two years and such after graduation to see what the recidivism rate is. The philosophy that we've always had in Champaign County is we're not in to get people in and out and say, yay, they graduate. My philosophy has always been, I want to change your life. I want this to be for the rest of your life. It doesn't work that way always because we're dealing with addiction. The highest percentage of people who recidivate do it within one year. And it keeps going down. So the, the latest recidivism rates we did, five and a half years after graduation, we still have 184 people of those 290 that graduated as of May who have not recidivated. Uh, no misdemeanors, no felonies, no petitions to revoke that we found. The multi-site evaluation showed that the average drug court participant committed an average of $7,111 worth of crime in an 18-month period. Well, if you take just four and a half, those five and a half years, and that's three 18-month periods, these people have been out. If you assume that since they haven't been arrested, 
even the cost of when they were in drug court of $7,100 were not spending, that's more than a $20,000 savings for each of those graduates who hasn't recidivated in over four and a half years. Uh, so that 11, uh, and then you take the 11,400 over a comparison person during the 18 months that they were in that they also saved, and you multiply that times three, that's $34,000. If you add that together, these 184 who have not recidivated in five and a half years, if you talk about 54,000 per graduate, that's over $9 million saved. That's almost $10 million. And we're not counting the people who haven't recidivated, recidivated after one year, two years, three years, four years, and we're not counting any of those 184 who graduated more than five years ago. And there's a number of them out there. So if you look at this, add it all up, that's about $16 million at a minimum that Champaign County Drug Court has saved over a comparison group of people in the same situation. I wanted to let you know that we believe this is what we're doing, and it's all based on research. And when we started doing statistics, it looked like our graduation rate was about 30% of the people who came in. Uh, after Amber was hired and after we got part-time sheriff's deputy on our team, and I only asked for quarter-time one when we got a grant, and after the grant ran out, Dan Walsh said as long as we had uh, an employee who wanted to do it, he'd keep the quarter time on, and that's still continuing. After we got the coordinator in law enforcement, our graduation rate rose to 34%. Now, if you look at this, that 34% starts from our first graduation in 2000. So that's not just since the 30%, that's over the period of time. As of our May graduation, our graduation rate for the whole 18 years has now risen to almost 42%. But a lot of that I attribute to having the coordinator and having law enforcement on the team. Uh, and law enforcement is huge. It may seem counterintuitive, but when we almost lost the law enforcement after the grant was about ready to run out, we asked the participants and a number of them wrote comments so I could show the chiefs of police when I kind of went to them and asked for money, they wanted that law enforcement. Basically, it helps keep them monitored so they know somebody's watching them and they're not going to mess up uh, as you would think. So they really like law enforcement. I've got multiple convicted felons walking up to an officer in uniform and asking for help and getting it. I have that officer who goes to their home talking to them and talking to their family. Because a lot of times the family doesn't know what's going on and can give them information. This is what you have to do. Uh, and in fact, our drug court law enforcement officer has been involved in solving certain crimes that might not have gotten done if it wasn't for that person being involved and helping out. So I attribute this increase in the law enforcement and having the coordinator helped out. And if you ever want to do something for drug court, give me more time as a law enforcement officer instead of quarter time, and I think we'll, our graduation rates are going to continue to go up. Uh, but who saves? There's fewer police calls, less incarceration, fewer court cases, less proper damage, fewer thefts, less forgeries, which is lower insurance costs for you know our business owners, our homeowners in the town. Uh, more families stay together because I keep people who would normally go to the penitentiary in town. They stay here, they get cleaned up, they start working and getting a job and still wait until they're out on parole. Keeps the family together a lot of times because nobody is leaving, hopefully, and they're learning responsibility, responsibility so the kids stay together and at home and they're starting to have a role model. So keeping families together is big. More employment and taxes paid. Like I said, I've got managers at different businesses all over the town. And uh, children, again, children staying with their family, they're out of the system. DCFS is normally out of their lives. There's been a number of women who've gone through drug court who have shown DCFS that they can do it. They're close friends with their children now. I mean, these are all the results of things that we have done. And that's the presentation I provided for you. I did bring 
also um, our latest recidivism rates. And so you can look at the numbers that we have um, on here, and we can cash those out. Any questions? Is it all right if I call on them or you want to call on them? Oh. Okay. Uh, the hand over there was first, sir. Judge Ford, uh, you st at, at one point you only had a quarter time sheriff's deputy helping you. Is that changed? No, that's it's still a quarter time sheriff's deputy. I would it, like more time. I I had asked the previous sheriff about that and didn't get any any movement on it. Maybe we can kind of work to talk to the new sheriff. I, I would I would love to. I think the the new sheriff would be very receptive to all this. Uh, but again, it's their manpower. You know, they have to have a certain amount of deputies out on the street. If they don't have the manpower, it can't happen. And even my deputy, if there's an emergency call, he's got to go out. He can't come in. So there, there's a lot of dynamics there. But would I love to have one? Yes, because I think it would help out everybody. Um, somebody else have a question? Yes, sir. Um, thank you for coming to the Madison County Public Defender. Uh, I wanted to ask. I want to make sure it was clear. You, you said in order to be eligible for this program, you must plead guilty to a felony? Yes, sir. Now, is that for first-time offenders also? Well, we don't take first-time offenders. Oh, uh, and most first-time offenders would not meet the high-risk, high-needs okay. that we need. Uh, most of, you know, as you could tell, a lot of them have been through the system. I have people whose record, the one I took in today, record started in 1974 and he went to the penitentiary. Uh, but, you know, they, they're getting old enough and they, they want to change. And it's sometimes they're older is a little bit more motivated. <coughs> Although I've had 21-year-olds graduate too. So, uh, you know, but we, we take, we try and take the ones that we, we need to under the standards set by the Supreme Court. Do, do you guys have a number on how many of those defendants have uh, public defenders versus private attorneys? Uh, there's more than that. There's... More public defender clients, but today the one I brought in was a private attorney. And uh, the private, there's a number of private attorneys. In fact, there's some public defenders, fire public defenders, that are now in private practice, and they get a mix. Uh, but it's it just depends. Uh, I'll take anybody who wants to, <laughs> who qualifies and wants to do this. Okay. I mean, I just want to make sure, like, uh, I, I would hate to see one of these defendants more or less copping out to this thing so for the sake of picking the poison. Well, the, the thing about it is, and, and a lot of attorneys will tell their, their clients, look, uh, it's easier to go to the penitentiary. You've been to the penitentiary before. You can do the time. But this judge is going to be in your life for two, maybe more years than that. And if you really mess up, you can still get sentenced to the penitentiary. What do you want to do? Again, it's a voluntary program. Uh, but I have a number of people who want it. Now, some see it as a way, oh, they've beaten probation before. They can, you know. But for a two-year period or so that they're seeing me every week, uh, you catch them. And I have some people who came in who thought they were just going to scam the system and ended up graduating. And all of a sudden, they started realizing life is better here. Okay. Now, now, what's the – are there any numbers on – you said it's a 19-month program, like uh, – are defendants taking that in contrast to like five year sentences, ten year sentences, uh, career criminal sentences? Like, the, I can't take people who aren't eligible for probation, but right. I have taken people who are eligible for up to fifteen years in the penitentiary. Okay. Some are one, three up to three years, some are up to six years, some are up to ten years, some are up to fourteen. But you know, they'll come in, and a number, like I said, a number have been to the penitentiary before. They're not afraid of the penitentiary. They know that they can handle it if they go. The question is, do they want to spend the time with me? Because getting away from addiction is a very difficult thing to do. And this is probably the hardest thing any of them have ever done in their life. And I have people who have been using for 20, 30 years. 
so it's not like they just started last week. And it's a very powerful force, and they're very comfortable with their addiction. And so it, it, it's difficult. It's not easy for them to do, and it takes a lot of people a lot of work together to just, I've got to build trust. The, the research has shown a lot of people that come to us have had prior trauma in their life. They don't want to talk about it. They don't trust the police. They don't trust their attorneys. They don't trust the judges. And if we can't get them to trust us, then they will not get, we can't get to the reason that they're using in the first place, and there's nothing we can do. So if you walk into my court from day one, it's different than any other felony court they've walked into. And I treat it differently, and I talk to them more because from day one, I've got to earn trust because if we don't, we're spinning our wheels. Thank you. John? Yeah, I'd like to congratulate you and your team for a job well done. And I want to encourage all board members to go to graduation. I've, I've been a couple of times. And, uh, and when you go to graduation and hear these people talk, how it changed their lives and talk to their families afterwards, it's really not, not that you need more validation, but the numbers are great. But I really want to encourage the board members to go to graduation. It's very and We do send out invitations as to graduation. There will be a change from now on because there's no more Urbanic Civic Center. But we have talked to Rosecrans, and they have a big uh, auditorium room where they're going to allow us to have our graduation. And the next one will be after we've completed 20 years of drug court, so it may be a little bit more of a celebration. I can't guarantee on how many will graduate, but we'll have a little bit more of a celebration because if we have one ready, we'll graduate that first one. Yeah, we'll have more than one. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, twelve-step programs and uh, sobriety-based treatment. Um, do you also use uh, like medical evidence-based yes. treatment, like uh, medication-assisted treatment? Yeah. We do. Uh, I was able to talk Carl into donating some money for a medication called Vivitrol, which is naltrexone in shot form, which sits on the receptors in the brain. But we also have had people on uh, methadone and people on Suboxone. Uh, we work with them. We also we get releases, and we have MOUs with people who will be involved with it so we can get all the information so we can kind of share the information. But, no, uh, we don't turn down anybody on medication-assisted treatment until we find out that they're starting to abuse it, and then we work with the provider to, to get a handle on that. Okay. So I've never turned down anything that's going to help these people who any other. Uh, there's research that shows that for certain populations, uh, religious-based treatment is better, and if they want to go, fine. Anything that's going to help, uh, we're not going to turn them away. Um, I, I, I guess sort of it, along that line, um, do you feel like there are people who are in the community who would benefit from this program who are not eligible under the current requirements? Well, yes, but uh, the current requirements are set by the Supreme Court, basically. And the, the thing about it is, is I need – the research has shown that the most important person – now, everybody on the team is very important, and it's, we treat it as a team, but it's the judge where they have to come in front of every week uh, that is really very important to them. So if they're not coming to court for certain reasons and you don't have that hook where – because you got to get them in the beginning. If they think I got to come, uh, then you're not going to be as successful. Thank you. Everything we do is evidence based. It's all research based. Uh, I don't want to, you know, go out there and do things that aren't going to work. Yes, ma'am. Is cognition work still involved with drug court using CBT? No. Just wondering. Uh, we. We used to start people with cognition work, which is cognitive skills training, uh, but there's moral recognition therapy, which they do at the jail now too, which is a little bit more basic, and it will go to a lot of people that cognition work won't work with, and we start with MRT first, and when they finish MRT, we now go to um, cognition works, and uh, we've just started a new program, and I'm starting it with the women's population because it really works well from what the research shows called Secret Safety that works uh, with people with trauma backgrounds. And so I wanted to start with the women first, and I've got 
normally when I reach out, because either we don't want to spend, have a lot of money, I have somebody who worked in the probation office and from the state's attorney's office who worked with victims before who read the book and said she'll do it. So uh, we, we still have to pay her, but uh, we got somebody we know, we trust, and we don't have to pay a lot to get that done. So we just started it this month. So anything that works that we can afford, we're going to do. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Um, you mentioned earlier I think the term you used was pre-adjudicatory. Is that correct? Pre, pre-adjudicatory. Uh, there's 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 post-adjudicatory, which is us, takes two guilty. There's pre-adjudicatory, and that's how a lot of the courts started nationally. Uh, the research has shown the post works better. But pre-adjudicatory, people can plead guilty, but they're not sentenced, or they sign some sort of contract, and so they haven't been convicted or been involved yet, and the contract would be, we're not even going to charge you if you complete this. Uh, there, there are still some. There's a few in Illinois. Uh, the research really doesn't say it's that cost effective, uh, which is why uh, they're falling out of favor, and that's why the Supreme Court said if you want to be certified as a drug court, you take this other population. So, so is it you're saying it's required to be part of the system? In, well, it's not required. Well, in Illinois, if you want to be certified as a drug court, then you're post. Then okay. you, you take high risk, high need. If you have a pre adjudicatory and you want to take the high risk, high need, you can. But uh, most don't do it that way because it's a different population mm -hmm. than than the other population, and you really need a more of a hook on them. Then they haven't even been convicted yet. Okay. Um, wh what role exactly does the uh, deputy play? Uh, well, one, they're in court. Uh, they're seen. They know what's going on with these people. They'll go to their home. Uh, a lot of times, you know, some of the comments we got from people when we were about to leave is that uh, gives me support outside of being in drug court. Keeps the riffraff out of my apartment complex. And a lot of people that are in there, if they have housing, don't live in the best neighborhoods. But the officer comes by, doesn't arrest anybody, doesn't louse anybody, just goes and talks to them, talks to the family. It helps earning trust and building trust. We've had a number of people go and even in court or outside of court go and ask about orders of protection, other things that they need to do. We had one person who was working and not getting paid, and the officer kind of mediated that because the person got paid. But, you know, there's, there's all these things, and a lot of these people don't have a lot of experience on how to handle some of these problems. And the officer just goes to their home, knows everybody, uh, they trust him, and you get more things done. And so it's, it's a real trust issue. And it's, it's your community-based policing that a lot of uh, areas are trying to get to that don't have. And, and again, it's, it's the officer now sees how these people live and can come and come back to us and say, this is what this person needs. Uh, so it, it, it's a two-way street, too. And the officers that have done this have found it a different type of policing, but they find it uh, a nice change, and it's something that they haven't really been involved with before, and they're very interested in it. And I've, I've talked to officers in other communities who you know will collect clothing or stuff for the people there. I mean, it's a lot of trust, but it's just human relations. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you think there's an increased amount of time that the deputy is in prison programs. Mm -hmm. is, is there any other things that you think are increasing time? There, there are two things I really need. Uh, I need more deputy time, and I want the ability to drug test on the weekends. Uh, and there's communities all over the country where they can do some of the weekend stuff because they do go to the jail and test. Uh, but if we don't have enough people in corrections over there, that can't happen. We are talking to Rosecrans. There's, they can't do it right now with their setup, but they're talking about hiring somebody who might be able to test on the weekends and do our people too. So it's all in play. But the two biggest things we need are uh, more deputy time and the ability to test on the weekends. Because we have some people who know, okay, if I test on Thursday, I'm probably not going to be tested on Friday. Won't be tested Saturday or Sunday. And they, they do that. And we, we, fix, we try and figure that out and try and strategize for that, but we can't hold it down. How often do you guys test? A and that's what I was about to say. And it's random. So one week they may get one, 
week sometimes, one week it's three, other times, you know, it just depends with the two, and it's not like it's Thursday and, and Tuesday, it's, you know, you can do Thursday and Friday, sometimes you can do the next Monday, or other days, so you know. There's a random call, random call in there as well. Or yeah. Or the Lord will send you a transcript. Because sometimes we cut the Lord's transcript. Sometimes we bring. And and of course, the, the one other thing is that I tell the the listen, if that person comes in and they weren't supposed to test, but you think they need to be tested, don't do it. Yes, sir. Yeah. First start off, off, like Mr. Rector, just thank you for the work you do, and it's a tremendous benefit to this community. This is just a, kind of a wild thought, and I don't know if it would even be able to work out. Um, just the idea of maybe if Urbana and or Champaign could give a quarter officer. I mean, would that even... That was it, brought up by the chief. I don't know if it would even be able to no, work out. Because, but. again, we're talking about building trust. Okay. And, and you need somebody who deals with... The, the, same the same person, people so you over have, and over again, yeah, so okay. you can build. It that wouldn't trust. work with, in that unless you could somehow maybe give, and individual people a certain officer, but I don't. That probably the would be hard have to, to work. come to the staffing, yeah. and so I'm not too sure all of the different departments are going to send somebody. Yeah, I was, I was gonna, I, like I said, I didn't know if it would even be able to oh, work. Yeah. And, and the sheriff's deputy seems like a natural fit because they are all over the county and even in in the cities every once in a while. So it, it's much more of a natural fit. Yes, sir. To that idea. Um, because it, it, obviously if we're trying to pool resources, um, if we're talking to the community police departments though about the benefit that we're all seeing community and countywide, um, is there, a, might there be a way to even prod them a little bit for funds? Which is why about 10 years ago I went to the chiefs of police and I said, let's do this. And they said, oh, great idea, we don't have any money which is why after we got the grant and after one year was over, I went to the chiefs of police with these comments and said, this is the results we're getting. Can we do that? It's a good idea, but we can't afford it. So then Sheriff Walsh agreed that if he had somebody who wanted to do it, we could do it. So I just, you know, I asked. I couldn't get any agreement. But that was my first thought. Everybody benefits. Why not give these pools to people? Well, Thanks thank a lot for coming much. out. All right. Um, we have the monthly reports from the various departments. Um, no objection. Those will be placed on file. Um, there's no other business, and there's not a sheriff's report. So that's it. Okay, our next committee report will come from the policy personnel and appointments from Dr. Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Vice Chair Lorraine Coward, you're doing an excellent job, by the way. One, under policy personnel and appointment, new business um, appointments, reappointments, A, a list of appointment expiring, in 2019 information only. B, under the sheriff appointment, the policy committee is recommending the approval of Cynthia E. Cunningham, Democrat, to the sheriff mayor commission for the term 12-1-2018 to 11-30-2024. I so move and need a second motion. Anjai. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor by saying aye. aye. Any nay? Motion passed. C, under the county executive appointment, the policy committee is recommending the approval of Ryan Elwell, current ZBA member, to the zoning board of appeal chair for the term 1 1 2019 to 11 30 2022. 
So who's second? <laughs> we got it. Any discussion? All in favor by saying aye. aye. Any nay? Motion passed. D, under Rural Transit Advisory Group, the policy committee is recommending the approval of Laurel Lawson to the Rural, the, to the rural Transit Advisory Group for the term 1 1 2019 to 1231 2020. I so move and need a second motion. All second. Any discussion? All in favor by saying aye. aye. Any nay? Motion passed. E, under Eastern Illinois Economic Development Authority Board, the policy committee is recommending the approval of Mitchell Swim to the Eastern Illinois Economic Authority Board for the term 1-21-2019 to 1-19-2025. I so move and need a second. Okay. Any discussion? Get the all in favor all in favor by saying aye. Aye. Any nay? Motion passed. Two county clerk A December twenty eighteen and semi annual report. The policy committee has accepted these report and placed them on file. Three county executive A monthly AR report. November and December 2018, the policy committee has accepted this report and placed it on file. B, under content, under content evaluation committee, recommendation for the circuit clerk position, the policy committee is recommending the approval of a financial manager. I so move and need a second. I just have a comment and I, I, yes. I, I think it's probably okay if we just continue with this but again I want to bring up so we're doing voting differently than we did before so before what it was is in the cow that the person read the agenda item and then and I know we did this in the last cow we did the same thing in the last cow but how mm -hmm. it used to be was in the cow you would read the agenda item whoever's the chair and then some other person would first and second it and so we did this the same way in that special meeting we had with finance and that's why I kept raising my hand and saying this isn't how we had not done it so just I don't know maybe at some point we need some clarification because I this I just want us okay. to recognize we are doing this and then this way is how we did okay. it in the full board meeting right so well, but and, and so we, but to be fair this is how we did it at the last meeting as well which is why I kept raising my hand in the last meeting but this is I just want us to acknowledge that this is sort of different right <laughs> so we went through this at, at policy yeah. and with mm -hmm with the new county executive and this was the way that she presented that according to the rules as vice chair and his understanding was that's the way that the new rules were right. that he could recommend to the committee and then take a second so okay. anyway that's that I'm just saying that's what we discussed right. at, our, at our pre meeting okay. with with the new county executive and that was our understanding okay. That that's the correct. That's, what that I got that's the way we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not saying that's correct, but that was our understanding. Is that true, Charles? Yes, that is true. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's true. Yeah, I, I mean, my understanding is that Charles is chairing this portion of the meeting, and that the chair shouldn't make a motion according to Robert's rules. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of these things that's probably not important until it's really important. So, this is our first cow. Our uh, previous we've had, other than the organizational, that was even a board. All our previous meetings have been board, actual board meetings, but this is our first cow. Yeah, so, so I, I mean, I, I think, um, like, it makes sense for, for Charles to, for example, read the item, ask someone for a motion, and ask for a second. I think that's, that would be the correct way to do it. Well, this is what we agreed on to do it. This is the way we went through the, the yeah. rules with the, with the new ch with the new county executive. So it's not like Charles and John made this stuff up. Right. No, I'm I not in so we can... We, you know, before the next cow, we could get our uh, eyes dotted and T's crossed. Right. But uh, this is what we'd worked on. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just as a, just a real quick, just because I am such a nerd, 
and literally teach Robert Rules of Order. I just this isn't right. This I don't think this follows Robert Rules of Order, okay. which I don't know if that I, I don't know if that ultimately matters, but just it do, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I may, I agree with Stephanie. This doesn't follow the rules. I, I think the executives here, and maybe she could explain why uh, we don't want to follow the rules in the cow, but. Uh, the normal course of events, and I only speak to this because I was chair of the ZBA for eight years, was the chair could only entertain a motion, and someone would have okay. to make that in another second. And that's the format I'm familiar with, and so I, I'm sort of sitting here a little confused myself. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. I'm in the process still trying to learn all of this, so. <laughs> wow. Yes. Oh, Darlene. Question: The question would be whether Ms. Coward is actually chairing the meeting, and and she's turned over this part of the meeting to the areas of responsibility, but they're not actually the committee. They're not. There's not a committee. They're not actually a committee. They're an area of responsibility, and so technically they're not chairing the meeting. Um, but that's real. That's up to you guys. If you want to do it differently, that's fine. So anybody that's at this meeting could make the motion. And in this case, we were just, I just suggested that the person make the motion since they're already reading it. But that's up to you guys if you want to change that back. Yeah, I would, I would argue that if you are reading and then calling on, I mean, so far we haven't had any discussion, but if you are reading and calling on people, your chair, you are chairing that portion of the meeting, I, I would, in any understanding of the word chairing. I would think. Okay, well, I'd, I'd like her to be over to the committee chair, mm -hmm. and, and that's the way we usually do a turnover to the committee chair. And although sometimes the chair of the county board would call on the people <coughs> for certain committees, we would call over to on the people, but not for all the committees. Yeah, the only so dis I, the only discussion about it is that. There, there are these people aren't at committees. The policies, the policy of personnel is not a committee. It's part of the committee of the whole as an area of responsibility. So it's not a committee unto itself. That's just how your bylaws read. It, but again, however you want to do it. If I may, then who gives the chair report of this area of responsibility as it's listed on the agenda? Probably the chair that makes the motion. Right. Which is the chair. Following okay. the rules, then they can't make the motion. Okay. We're, we're sort of chasing our own tail here. I'm willing to switch it. So. Mm. I, I don't think anybody's like thinking that anything nefarious is going on here. It's just that making sure that nothing can come back on us. None of this is particularly earth moving stuff, and I don't think anybody's going to come back and try. But like, if everybody is just interested in keeping it consistent and following the rules that we're supposed to be following, uh, yeah, I don't think anybody's like, how dare you or how dare you do anything like this. It's just if we're going to follow it correctly so that nothing ever comes back on us. I, yeah, I mean, I, d I don't I want may, us to again, get sued. I'm not portenting that there's anything nefarious happening here, but there, as Prondel said, this isn't important until it is important. And so it may be good practice to stay in the habit that one in a hundred times that it is important. Yes. So yes. Sorry. Yeah, I, I assure you when we get to finance, I'm going to ask for somebody to make the motion at the at the cow, and when okay. we go to the full board meeting, then you would move, and that's why when we did the first special meeting, right. that was that was final action. That's why I made the motion and asked for a second, or or the county executive asked for the second because she was actually chairing the meeting. I made the motion. I think that's the way it's always been done. I think that follows Robert's rules um, because this is a committee meeting, and if you're a chair of responsibility, you are the chair, so you should ask for somebody. Again, I don't. I'm not saying this is nefarious, but I assure you on a finance portion, I'm going to ask for somebody because there are things there that are that people will come back on. So okay. I'm going to do it that way. Okay. So can I keep? It? Go ahead. Uh, just a real quick point. I mean, a lot of this does seem kind of nitpicky because these aren't important issues, but uh, less than two yeah. years ago, we got sued for not following Robert's rules. So I think it is important that we do follow okay. proper procedure. Okay. 
And, and if we get it sorted out on the non-controversial stuff, then you know it's a lot easier to do that than when we we actually disagree on the content. All righty, we're gonna keep it moving this way. Next time we we'll change it. Where I'm at? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Have to find out where I'm at. <laughs> B on the job content evaluation committee recommendation for the circuit clerk position. The policy committee is recommending the approval of a financial manager. I so move second. Who second? <laughs> Any discussions? All in favor by saying aye. aye. Any nay? Motion passed. And with the account clerk position, there is no action. B, other business. Does anybody have any business before the board? Okay. Okay, seeing there is none. C, from the policy chair report. One, the county executive appointment expiring February 28, 2019, information only. Lincoln um, Legacy Committee, one vacancy term 3 1 2019 to 2 28 2022. Designation of items to be placed on the consent agenda. Do we want to keep this agenda process the same? Okay. But put war. Um, so, for the consent agenda, do we need. Uh, uh, 1B, I could use a little help here. 1B, C, D, E. Which one? And then 3A, B. Or 3B. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Was that it? Okay. This conclude all my information, Madam Vice Chair Colbert. Thank you. Okay, the next order of business will be the Finance Committee. Mr. Collins. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, finance, item A1, new business, budget amendment transfers. Uh, A is budget amendment 18. Dash zero 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 seven six fund zero eight zero general corporate to department zero four two the corner increased appropriation sixteen thousand three hundred and seventy five dollars increased revenue seventy four hundred and seventy eight dollars the reason is to cover the end of the year former employee benefit payout and part time staff additional coverage. This will reimburse the autopsy line for fees collected for the lab expenses of, of other counties and additional Champaign County autopsy expenses through the end of December. Is there a motion? Mr. McGuire, is there a second? Mr. Ingram, is there discussion on this topic? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Item B. Budget Amendment 18-00077, Fund 685, Specialty Courts to Department 031, Circuit Court, Increased Appropriations $2,000, Increased Revenues $2,000. The reason is increased revenue was received and will be used to cover increased drug court expenses. expenditures. Is there a motion? Mr. Clements, is there a second? Mr. Young. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Item C, Budget Amendment 18-00081, Fund 621, State's Attorney Drug Forfeitures to Department 041, State's Attorney. Increased appropriations, $10,000. Increased revenue, none. It's from the fund balance. The reason is an increase in appropriations for end of year expenses. Increase will come from the fund balance. Is there such a motion? Mr. Clifford, is there a second? Mr. Esri, 
any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Item D, budget amendment 18-00082, fund 080 general corporate, uh, fund uh, to department 041 state's attorney, increased appropriations $1,831, increased revenue $1,831. The reason is increased appropriations to match state approved and funded increase to the state's attorney's salary. We do have the state's attorney here. If anybody has questions, is there such a motion? Ms. Portado, is there a second? Mr. Patterson, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Motion passes. Item E, budget transfer 180008, fund 080, general corporate, to Department 041, State's Attorney. The total amount is $23,918. The reason is transfer of personnel appropriations to pay for personnel expenses in Fund 675 due to a loss of grant funding. Is there such a motion? Mr. McGuire, is there a second? Mr. Young, discussion. Ms. Furtado. Um, I just, I know we've brought this up in the past, but I'd like to bring it up again, that I think that this is a case that indicates um, that it would be beneficial to the county to have a grant coordinator, somebody who's watching deadlines of grants, who's working with departments across the board, and who's helping take some of the onus of some of these grants off of them um, and doing research. I think that's the kind of position that would pay for itself quickly. Um, it's a position that I, it kind of blows my mind that we don't have in the county. Um, I know Rosencrantz does a lot of our grants, but, and I know, you know, we have different elected officials who are, are responsible for grants within their own shop, but I do think that there's some coordination that could be done to, to make sure sort of this kind of loss of grant funding doesn't go, um, and to take some of the burden off of the elected officials and to coordinate across, you know, some grants will use, you have people from different shops. So I know we've mentioned that before, uh, but going forward in the budget process, I do think that's a position that would make a lot of sense. Further discussion, Mr. Harford. Yeah, is this grant no longer available? Is that why? Oh, uh, we okay. do have the state's attorney, Ms. Reitz, if you would come respond to that, please. Thank you. Um, I absolutely agree with Ms. Furtado about the need for um, some, someone whose job it is to assist us with grants. Um, in this particular situation, this was a grant that we had for many, many years, and every year it was basically renewed, um, and then it changed, and we had to completely reapply, and they wouldn't and couldn't, I was told, tell us exactly when it was going to be released. Um, and so when we found out, we were a day late, um, and we put all the paperwork in. But um, my colleagues in Kane County similarly um, applied, reapplied essentially for a grant that they had had many, many years um, timely and didn't get their funding. From what I saw, um, what was what is being funded, what was being funded by this particular grant. Uh, was community-based organizations. So here locally, our community um, domestic violence organization, uh, sexual assault victim organization, races received significant funding out of this particular grant uh, that we didn't get. That we were told to um, watch the website, watch the website, watch the website, which we do regularly, pretty much daily. And it hasn't come back yet as an opportunity for us. So I, you know, <laughs> I can't tell you whether it's going to come back for us or not. Uh, but at this point, we're continuing to watch the ICJA, ICJIA website um, to see if if this particular victim um, support grant returns as a possibility for us. And we certainly would reapply. Um, but at this point. It's not there. 
Any other discussion? Um, as I understand, this is a, this is a statutory position. Is that correct? Well, it's a position that um, we have. We have statutory requirements as far as victim services go. Um, we have requirements as far as um, notification, support, assistance of uh, victims, crime victims, uh, and this is a position that helps us fulfill those statutory requirements. So, um, yeah, I would say it's it's absolutely needed. Any other, Mr. Shore? Uh, who, which group is providing this grant, please? The grant, the grant that we had previously, is monitored by. Um, the ICJIA, Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, um, it, and they are basically a state agency that um, supports and monitors grants uh, that come in that are federal grants generally, so it's federal funds um, that they're responsible for um, determining who's going to get them and then monitoring them. Any further discussion? Seeing none, none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Thank you. Item F, budget amendment 18-00086, fund 610 working cash to department 026 county treasurer, increased appropriations 37,800 are $37,387. Increased revenue, $3,787. Reason we earned more interest than we anticipated in the budget. Is there such a motion? Mr. Clemens, second. Mr. Tinsley, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Item G, Budget Amendment 19-0005, Fund 075, Regional Planning Commission, Department 870, Weatherization, NICOR. Increased appropriations, 85,000. Increased revenue, 85,000. The reason is to accommodate a new contract with NICOR that supplements the Illinois Home Weatherization Assistance Program. This contract will provide enhanced weatherization services in northern Champaign County, including insulation, air sealing, and health and safety measures for an additional 10 income eligible households. Is there a motion? Mr. Thorsland, second. Mr. Summers, discussion. Mr. Storr. Is that a minimum of 10? Uh, eligible households or are only or up to 10? I think we have folks. Okay, we don't, I guess we don't have anybody here that can answer that. Um, as I understand, it's for up to 10, but we can certainly find that out and get that answer by the time we get to the board meeting. Other discussion? All those in favor, uh, Ms. Furtado. I, I guess I would just say in other discussion, I would like to say again how helpful memos are. And yeah. when they're not included, that sometimes we don't know as much as we maybe could know. So yes. just in, the encouragement of memos to, that have words on them that go along with the financial charts that we get, I want to say that again. Yes, in our agenda meeting, we go through all these one by one, and we try to anticipate your questions and we don't always do a good job obviously we didn't on this one so okay all those in favor uh, Mr. McGuire I think the cost of the weatherization would determine how much money they would spend and that would be difficult to know whether it would be 10 or 12 I mean it turns out it's smaller it could possibly be more but that'd be a hard question to answer before the start of the job any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. I will I will suggest that we keep this off the consent agenda so that we can bring that question up at the board. So 
Item H, Budget Amendment 19-00006, Fund 075, Regional Planning Commission, Department 847, Permanent Supportive Housing, Physical Disabilities, even. Increased appropriations are 26,000, increased revenue 26,000. The reason is to accommodate alternating program years to provide subsidized rental assistance for low-income disabled adults. Moved by Mr. Ingram, second by Mr. Patterson. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Item I, Budget Amendment 19-00007, Fund 075, Regional Planning Commission, Department 848, Champaign County Safety Forecasting Tool. Increased appropriations, $184,200. Increased revenue, $184,200. Reason, provides for the development of a safety forecasting tool for estimating future crashes and projections of average daily traffic using the travel demand model. This tool will provide a platform to select and prioritize projects on safety, guide corridor and inter section safety enhancements, and support cost-benefit analysis of future projects. It will be a data-driven tool which will, will require geometric information of intersections and corridor segments. Is there a motion? Mr. Vachispati, second. Mr. Patterson, any discussion on this one? Mr. Esri. I'd say this one's probably the one that Reed is here for, if I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So if, she if could probably are, speak towards this one, yes. I would assume, if, if there's somebody has a question. Somebody has a question. Seeing seeing well, none. Uh, Ms. Much Kinko. of this I don't know what I just read. So if she could just explain what it is and how it would be used and where it would be used and what that would look like. Go ahead and come on up, Rita, great. please. Hi, good evening. Uh, what was the question? Just a little bit more elaboration on what the tool is and what it will do, why it's effective. Currently, we have a travel demand model in place for Champaign County and for Champaign Urbana. The travel demand model is able to estimate future traffic volumes in different roadways. Uh, the idea of this tool is to use the travel demand model uh, to be able to predict crashes based on the geometric conditions of the roadway of the intersections uh, into the future that when we are making improvements or suggesting improvement, we can test the different improvements and estimate the future number of crashes. But this is a tool that will be developing using our current travel demand model. It's not something that is out there. We'll have to do a lot of research to incorporate that into our current travel demand model. Other questions? Go ahead, Rita. Is the forecasting that this will do will be available to other county departments? So I'm thinking of the zoning board when we do, when I did things there, we used old ABC data. Sometimes so we work with the zoning department okay. when doing so traffic impact studies to okay. estimate future traffic volumes, but it will depend on the type of roadway because the travel demand model doesn't contain all the roadways in Champaign County, just the most important ones, then right. it will depend on the location uh, of that impro of that uh, zoning case to determine future traffic volumes. Right, but it's available for that. Yes, we have worked with John on okay. that. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Item J, fund 850, or, sorry, budget amendment 19 0008, fund 850, Geographic Information System Joint Venture, Department 111, Operations and Administration. Increased appropriations 42,000, increased revenue 27,000. The reason is for acquisition of LIDAR through USGS 3D elevation program, 
the majority of the expenditure to, to be paid with pass-through funds from the member agencies as reflected in the requested revenue increases. Funds from the CCGISC fund balance will be used for the remainder of the expenditure. Is there a motion? Mr. Storr, second. Mr. Patterson, discussion. Mr. Storr. Yes. Uh, I noticed that uh, Ms. Leah Briley is here, and I'd like to ask uh, Do we know yet what the posting or spacing of the uh, LIDAR is going to be for uh, for the county? Yeah, the majority of the county will be a, a four, point, four points per square meter. Um, however, Champaign and Urbana have chosen um, to increase their point cloud density to eight points per square meter. So there will be a 150-mile area that will be at eight points per square meter. I'm very pleased to hear this because we are a fairly flat county and the additional information will be very useful not only for uh, flood plain mapping but also to the agricultural community that require that, that, that looks at micro topography as part of their precision agriculture. Um, If we can, if we can, anything that we can do to increase that that spacing, to, to get more points per square meter, is is something that I would press the heck for, including anything anything that amounts to legal, <laughs> <laughs> or comes close. <laughs> Other discussion, Mr. Vachaspati. Yeah, just to follow up, what's the current, uh, in, in previous lot years, uh, what's the density um, of the? Well, the last time we acquired LIDAR was in 2008. It's very expensive. We're only paying a small portion of it. Um, so currently the 2008 point cloud density is, um, if we're lucky, two points per square mile. I said meter. I meant mile. No, I meant meter. You're right. Per square, per square meter. Yeah, sorry. I just confused myself. Other discussion? Other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, item two. Um, we are at the We're at the treasurer's report, the treasurer's report for November and December. I would ask that the treasurer, are they on file yet? They have not been on placed on file yet, so we can't accept them because they're not on file. Uh, auditor, monthly reports for November, December, are they available on the website? They are, so we shall accept those. Animal control, item four. Request approval of shelter medicine agreement between the Board of Trustees at the University of Illinois and the Champaign County Animal Control. This was in your packet. Do we have some? I don't think we've got anybody. Nobody here from Animal Control. Is there such a motion? Mr. Fachaspati, second. Mr. McGuire, discussion? The agreement is in the packet. I mean, it's an inter intergovernmental agreement, so. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Uh, item five, uh, Sheriff, request approval of an intergovernmental agreement for cost sharing of extended warranty for National Ballistic Information Network Equipment, technical support and training. Is there such a motion? Mr. Patterson, second, Mr. Ingram. The sheriff is here if we've got questions. That was a mouthful. Discussion, Mr. Vachaspati. Yeah, 
Yeah, if uh, the sheriff could just briefly explain what this is. Good evening. So the Nibin system is, especially with all the violent crime that we've been having in our community over the last couple of years, the Nibin system is something that will allow us to better analyze, for an example, if we have shell casings or some kind of evidence from a violent crime, a gun-related crime specifically, it will uh, better allow us to analyze that and then lead to a suspect. Um, we do, I believe, currently have um, the ability to do this, but it's through the Springfield Crime Lab, and so backlog, and, and this will allow us, um, City of Champaign got a grant for this, and so they're asking us to um, help with the extended warranty, and with that, we're also going to get access, we're going to have a deputy uh, or investigator who's trained on it as well. And uh, it's very important to me, at least, is even though we don't have very much violent crime in the county itself, um, criminals don't stop where the city lines stop, and we have several areas within the, uh, the city areas that are county jurisdiction that these can very well move over to. So, thank you. Other questions or discussion on this topic? Thank you, Sheriff. Appreciate it. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay? Motion passes. Item six, County Executive, FY general FY 2018 General Corporate Budget Fund Budget Projection and Budget Change Reports. Ms. Ogden, please. You actually have a copy of this report in your packet tonight. Um, because the meeting's a little later than normal, so I was able to um, get this completed in time to enclose it in the packet. Although this is a December report, I just want to make sure that you understand this is not the final report for fiscal year 2018, as the county will still continue to receive revenues and expenditures and post those to the fiscal year 2018 budget through February. Starting on the revenue page, I want to point out a few things, and I know that this is the first report that some of you um, have received, so I'll go through this in a little more detail than normal. In the property tax line, you can see the budget variance of a negative $582,000. This is predominantly due to the county preparing its property tax levy to capture new growth revenue in a potentially favorable ruling in the hospital property tax exemption case. There was no ruling in that case, and therefore, um, prior to the Board of Review closing the books in 2018, so these um, properties were not added to the tax rolls, and therefore, they, um, the county will not receive additional revenue in fiscal year 2018. This case is currently before the circuit court. Um, in January, this uh, was heard by the circuit court. So we have prepared the 2019 levy in the same manner. However, if there is no ruling or if there's an unfavorable ruling, then we will be in the same situation um, in fiscal year 2019. Under licenses and permits, the non-business license and permit revenues, the increase of, of $524,000 is predominantly related to a strong real estate market. And um, the uh, recorder's office uh, has indicated that there were numerous large commercial transactions in 2018 uh, that resulted in uh, very strong revenues that came in for document stamps. However, please keep in mind that the county has to turn around and distribute two-thirds of those revenues to the state for the purchase of document stamps, so there is an expenditure impact as well. Under state shared revenue, um, sales taxes, including PPRT and use taxes have been very strong in fiscal year 2018, so you can see uh, those are coming in and anticipated to come in over budget. However, income tax um, is expected to come in under budget, and that's predominantly due to the fact that the legislature had implemented a one-time 10% reduction in income tax revenues that we expected to sunset because it was a one-time 
um, cut. However, the legislature, instead of letting that um, sunset, extended it for a second 12 months at 5%. So that's why um, the county's receiving less revenues for income tax. In this line, that cut will extend into the first six months of 2019 as well. Do we anticipate then it will finally fade into the sunset? That's the hope. You could start talking to your state legislatures about that. Um, local government revenue, the uh, increase for of 91,000 is predominantly due to a, an additional TIF surplus distribution the county received from the city of Champaign. So that was $77,000. Um, we were informed that we would receive that final distribution last year, 2017. However, then surprise, they said, oh, due to the way the timing was and the calculation and the start and the end of the TIF, that there was a um, additional distribution that we were unaware of and therefore didn't put in our budget. And the difference is also um, additional TIF surplus that was received from the city of Muhammad as well. And then fees and fines and forfeitures, um, this is something that you know we have uh, indicated that there has been some volatility and they year to date, um, they are trending, the collection of these are trending higher than where we were this point last year. However, as those of you who have been on the board for some time have seen that fees and fines um, revenues have been decreasing year over year for many years. So we're still nowhere near um, the level that we were in prior fiscal years. I will say in the fees line, even though we're projecting that we're going to um, bring in less money that was in the budget, there are uh, some drivers of increased performance and some of those are related to uh, planning and zoning fees for the solar farms and as we have also talked about for the circuit clerk's office, um, the uh, electronic citation filing options that have also generated increased revenues there as well. Um, at this point, the projection for um, the budget variance is $440,000 over the originally approved budget for fiscal year 2018. On the expenditure side, um, we do anticipate under, underspending the personnel budget. Um, for commodities, I will point out the purchase document stamp line, the additional 358000 is that impact um, that I mentioned earlier with the increased collection for the revenue stamps. In the services line, we do anticipate underspending that line. However, I wanna mention, and I, it is included in this line, the um, county board did um, authorize RSM, which is a, a nursing home vendor, to be paid directly from this line. So that is um, also included in that line. And finally, um, the transfers to the nursing home fund. Um, upon preparation of this report, that transfer total, which included forgiveness of the $500,000 loan, two $250,000 loans, um, and also forgiveness of the boiler loan, which is 226,000. And this also included a transfer of $101,000 that was made to the nursing home and 91,000 um, approximately dollars that was made to the nursing home to um, take care of some uh, vendor uh, payments that needed to be brought current. So after the prior meeting that we just had with the approval of the transfer of $1.98 million, you will see this line increase by that amount next month with that report. And on the summary page, uh, revenue projection versus expenditure projection, the difference is at this point, um, without the $1.98 million was $505,000 surplus. You can see underneath this, however, um, that the impact of the $1.98 million transfer will increase expenditure for the county um, and reduce the county's fund balance by that amount. And so um, the ending fund balance projection at this point for the 2019 budget is 7.9%. That is below the county's minimum recommended fund balance 
um, which is 12 and a half percent of expenditures. Your financial policies uh, indicate that if your fund balance falls below the 12 and a half percent, that a plan will be implemented to restore it. So the plan to restore this fund balance will be to put, continue to proceed with the sale of the home and that will then allow for the county's fund balance to be restored. In the interim, there is also the issue of cash flow, which um, we will be coming to you um, at the meeting on the 24th to talk about, and that will be um, the request to issue a promissory note. Besides cash flow, whenever I think of fund balance, one of the things that I always think about is can it possibly have an adverse effect on our bond rating? And can you speak to that is in particular? If there is sort of a, a mitigation plan in place, will that address any concerns? Do you, do you anticipate um, another um, notice on our bond rating in between? So right now, Moody's is going to be focusing on our 2017 CAFR. Um, because that was just completed last month, so hopefully they'll, you know, be paying attention to that. Although um, we do usually have kind of a, uh, in the spring, I think it is spring to early summer, um, a minimal review by them, um, but they don't usually ask us for information. So unless they would go out and seek this information, they wouldn't be aware of that. However, um, if we do get an inquiry from Moody's, I think that you know we would work with um, Raven James um, to ensure that we laid out a plan and a process that they could understand and that would justify the reason that the county has taken the actions that it's taken and circumvent a downgrade. And and so even though that it, I do think that I heard some people gasp, you know, with the seven point nine, and I understand that it does it does put us in a more precarious right situation to sort of echo what Jim said about the um, the reality of the the money that we're owed this is also right the re the reality of the money that we owe and I think doing both of these things um, I, I think both of them were long overdue ultimately um, the the nursing home accounts payable is the county's obligation and that would fall upon the nursing home and again something that you know if Moody's were to inquire, we could explain, is a more transparent process that we're trying to get to um, with this plan. Any other questions regarding that part? Seeing none. Sorry, I flipped back. Okay. Did you did you want to go over the budget change report? Oh, um, Sorry. So the last report that you saw, um, let's see. Okay, the public defender use of revenue um, from sale of assets to purchase equipment. Um, that was the budget amendment that was approved in November, all the way down to VAC, um, the expense donations for veterans assistance. And then um, for December, the county clerk's budget amendments, the recorder, and the circuit court budget amendments were approved. Um, and of course, the uh, budget amendments that you approved tonight will be added to this report as well. Thanks, Tammy. Okay, now we're on item 6B, job content evaluation committee recommendation for reclassification of the circuit clerk financial manager position. It's in, in our packet on page 35, so it's it's forward in the packet um, where we discuss that. Is there such a motion? Ms. Fortado, is there a second? Second, Ms. King-Taylor. Discussion? This is setting the salary for an, an upgrade for that position after the evaluation. Mr. Patterson. I guess, is there anybody who can speak to... Uh, why the second position wasn't uh, changed in the spirit, or why it like was to the um, job content evaluation and it wasn't changed in that current one? Yeah, they they evaluated and said there would be no change, and that was evaluated in December. In December, I mean, was that evaluated through CAFSME? I don't. No, this uh, was through the job review committee. If you see, there's two parts to that. One requested. Um, this the review which was done and then this is the financial 
implication. There was a financial implication to the one, which was an upgrade from grade I to grade K, or grade J to grade K. And then the other one is um, there was not an upgrade because they're still in the same classification. Just want to apologize. I just realized I was off topic. Oh. <laughs> All right. No issues. <laughs> any, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign or nay. None. Okay, now we go to the handout. Item 9, finance, A, new business. Number 7, planning and zoning. Request of approval of application and if awarded the acceptance of the pre-disaster hazard mitigation planning grant. Is there such a motion? Mr. Patterson, second. Mr. Esri, discussion. John, we do have John Hall if you have questions on this. This was approved the other night at ELUC, came out of the ELUC committee. Any discussion? Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Okay, is there any other business to bring before the board? Ms. Fortado. Um, I just wanted to quickly commend, in, just in, in case folks didn't see it, because it sort of fell right before the new year, but I wanted to commend the city of Champaign uh, for recently rolling out their program uh, for the city to certify minority and women-based businesses. Um, and um, they did that, and at the first time they had a partnership with first followers who came, I think, in like the first half a day, they had 15 women and minority-based businesses uh, that were certified. And I really think that that kind of thing lies at the nexus of both finance, policy, and personnel, and uh, uh, social justice in, in a really interesting way. Uh, all the committees that we you know, have at the Committee of the Whole. And um, I've, I've mentioned this uh, to the county executive, but I, I, would, I know it was a long process for Champaign. My understanding is it took three years to get to that point. And I know it's something that the county has considered in the past and at that time decided not to do because they didn't think that we do enough business to make it worthwhile. Uh, but I'll just say, as somebody who in a former life was a staff member at a, play, at a consolidated city county that had that kind of list um, and was somebody who was often um, letting out contracts and things like that, uh, the awareness that that kind of program does in order to bring a more diverse um, local business uh, sort of ownership, just to bring awareness to staff of what those businesses are, uh, it, was, it made a huge difference to me. And also, I don't think we should underestimate, even if we only have a small amount of business that we do, and not as much of these kind of things that, as, say, a city like Champaign would do. For a lot of these, these are really small businesses, right? And uh, just a little bit of business can make a really big difference to, to some of these small women-based and minority-based biz, uh, um, businesses. So this is the kind of thing, I think we have a good model in Champaign. Uh, maybe it won't take us three years because we could use some of what they did and learn from what they did, but it's something that I would like our committee, the finance committee, but all of, all of the committees to be moving forward, um, and I'd like that to be a goal in uh, going forward in 2019. And I second Stephanie. I'm looking into it. Matter of fact, I got an appointment next week with uh, Rachel Joey over at the city building. Any other business? Seeing none, there is no chair's report. Items to be designated for the consent agenda. Finance A1, A, A1A, B, C, D, E, F, H, I, J, Item 4A, Item 5A, Item 6B, and Item 7A. Does that, uh, that agree with everybody's records? With that, Madam Vice Chair, I conclude my report. Thank you, Mr. Rose. You might want none. Okay, we're going into other business. We need approval of the closed session minutes for November 13, 2018. Okay. Okay, Mr. 
uh, Ezra and and Kinsley. And Kinsley. Okay. Any discussion or all in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Is there any other business need to be presented in front of the board? Seeing nine, we are adjourned. <laughs>